Welcome to CS520. My name is Phil Hatcher and I will be teaching the course this semester. As you know, the course lectures will be delivered via video and can be watched at your convenience. However, there is a schedule posted on the course website that you will need to keep up with in order to be successful in the course. We will meet in person once a week for both recitation and laboratory. My goal for the lectures is to give the impression that I am working just with you, one to one. The videos will be low key and low tech me just explaining the concepts to you. But you will need to do your part, watching the videos, attending and actively participating in recitation and lab. Bring your questions and problems to these sessions so that we, all of us, together can work them out. I welcome feedback on the course and I welcome your questions. Please feel free to email me or stop by my office at any time. I may not always be able to respond immediately, but I will respond as quickly as I can. Here are my goals for the course. We're going to pull back the curtain and see what is operating behind the scenes. For instance, when you execute a Java program, what is the Java virtual machine? What is a garbage collector? What is a thread? Or for C++ programs, what does the C++ compiler do? What is a linker? What is a library? And I want to convince you why knowing this is important how knowing this information will be important to your career. And I also want to try to convince you that it is cool. I enjoyed taking this course when I was in your shoes many years ago, and I really enjoy teaching it now. The technology underlying how software applications execute is just beautiful, and understanding how the pieces go together is fascinating, at least for me. I hope I can help you see that too. This course can even change your life. I was a math major, but my older brother insisted I should take the equivalent of CS520 at Purdue, Purdue University where I did my undergraduate degree. He was a business major, but had followed his girlfriend into the course and had loved it. He eventually went on to found his own IT services company, serving banks and banking software vendors on a worldwide basis. But he knew me. Sometimes in life, people near to you know you better than you know yourself. And he knew that I would be fascinated by learning more about what goes on under the hood of a computer. And of course he was right. I left the world of abstract math for the very concrete world of how software really works. I did finish my math major, but my MS and PhD are in CS. But the material covered by this course is not just beautiful, it is also useful. I want you to see that there's more to life than just Java and that understanding this is important. But don't take my word for it. I want to read you two quotes from prominent people in the industry. By the way, what is the current definition of prominent? It means they have their own Wikipedia entries. So Google them when you have a chance. I was kind of freaked out when I realized that there are people graduating with CS degrees who'd never written C. They just started in Java and they stayed there. That just seemed bizarre and wrong. Also, a little knowledge is power. I see people that are really smart. I would say they're good programmers. But say they only know Java. The way they think about solving things is always within the space they know. They don't think end to end as much. I think it is really important to know the whole stack, even if you don't operate within the whole stack. By stack, the author of the quote means all the layers of software that sit between the hardware and the high-level application. You might, th might think, and why is it important to know the whole stack? There are all these beautiful abstractions that are backed by shit. The implementation of libraries that look like they could be beautiful are, sh are shit. And so if you're the one responsible for the cost of buying servers or reliability, if you're on call for pages, it helps to actually know what's going on under the covers and not trust everyone else's libraries and code and interfaces. The quotes are from Coders at Work, Reflections on the Craft of Programming by Peter Seibel. If you are serious about programming, I recommend reading it. It contains interviews with 15 master programmers. This course can give you knowledge that is also a career distinguisher. 
I used to be a COBOL programmer in Michigan City, Indiana. Most of the people I worked with were only lightly trained. They knew business processes and they knew COBOL, but they were light on the technology side. When things went wrong, I was very popular. I could decode octal dumps that came spewing out of our mainframe when something went horribly wrong. And my boss definitely noticed. I could debug tricky situations. I had a better understanding of performance issues. I could solve problems and not just call for help. This course is also important in the eyes of the companies that hire our graduates. The CS Department Industry Advisory Board was initially somewhat reluctant for us to teach CS415 and CS416 using Java. We used to use C++. They wanted to be sure that C would still be emphasized. Students would still learn about real pointers and memory addresses. Students would still learn about new, delete, malloc, free, and how to deal with memory leaks. By the way, they also pushed hard for the department to increase our coverage of threaded programming, which is why this course now spends a considerable amount of time on it. What are my credentials? I have taught at UNH for a long time, and I have taught this course nearly all of that time. I have been involved in a series of research projects over the years that heavily involve the material taught in this course. This includes both compilers to support parallel computation as well as virtual machines of various flavors. What should your credentials be? Of course, you should already know the basics of programming. And you should know basic data structures. Most students should already have completed CS515 data structures, which is the formal prerequisite for this course. Some students might be able to take CS515 and CS520 at the same time. But I assume you have been exposed to programming using C++. And you must be ready for the intensity of the programming projects we will do in this course. The programs we do, if not necessarily longer, will certainly be trickier than what you have done before. So what do we cover in this course? First, the very basics of what is under the hood. Also, what data and programs look like at runtime in the memory of the machine. What is the language of the machine? What does the machine execute directly? It doesn't execute C or C++ or Java. It executes something lower level. Programming projects will be done in C with a little bit of assembly language programming thrown in. You will get practice with pointers, bit manipulation, memory allocation, and deallocation, and CIO. We will do multi-threaded programming with C and POSIX threads. We will also study how threads are implemented. And along the way, we will look back and reflect on how the technology has changed over time. So, looking at a Java program for a minute, your Java code plugs into a much bigger software infrastructure. There is the Java virtual machine, and a garbage collector, a just-in-time translator, threads. What is all this stuff? We will find out. And it sits on top of the operating system, which sits on top of the hardware. CS620 will cover operating systems in detail, so in this course, we will usually pretend that we are programming directly on top of the hardware. Or consider a C++ program. Your C++ source code must first be translated by the C++ compiler to native code for the machine you are running on. Then it is linked with code in the C++ libraries. In the end, your code ends up sitting in the middle of a big software infrastructure. By the end of the semester, this picture will make, this picture will make a lot more sense to you. And along the way, we want to help you work on these following skills as well. Develop professional programming habits. Good code layout. Good code documentation. You want your program to be something you can show your grandmother, and she will appreciate it. 
She may not read C code, but if you lay out the code well and you document it well, she will appreciate how it looks and she will be able to read a few high-level comments that helps her see the big picture. You want to develop discipline to always be interested in what the code looks like to readers of the code, including yourself at some point in the future when you have forgotten all the details you knew when you were writing it. Have standards for yourself and keep to them. To become like a professional, first act like one. Accept that testing is your responsibility, not someone else's responsibility. A professional does not hand code over to someone until it has been thoroughly tested. This is true even if the organization has official testers. Those testers are not there to find your bugs. They are not there to do unit testing that you should have done. They are there to find design bugs, for instance, and how different modules interact. So, learn to take pride in your work. Don't hand in crap. Don't hand in code that just passes the public tests. Do your own testing too so you're not surprised at the grade I assign you when I test it. Work to develop your debugging skills. This is largely an exercise in building confidence. And you build confidence by working at the task, by writing programs and debugging them. Work at it, work at it, work at it, and you will get better. Remember, when you are at your first job, do you plan to go to your boss with every bug you encounter? You will be expected to perform largely independently. Prepare for that day. Work now at becoming confident and independent. But of course, when you need help, reach out for it. And when you do ask for help, don't just accept a solution, but also study how the person helped you. What was their debugging strategy? Develop your own debugging strategies and then use them. A strong ability to isolate and solve bugs is another career distinguisher. Problem solvers go places. Problem generators, not so much. Okay, let's stop here for now. Be sure to look at the course website in detail to understand what you've gotten yourself into and what the rules of the game are. Bring any questions you have to recitation or email me.